So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to our final lecture for this semester on natures. I'm super happy to um, introduce our just freshly arrived from LA guest, Liam Young. <laughs> That's such an honor that somebody just came from, for one lecture from LA directly to the school, as if it was around the corner and it, as if it was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's like catching a bus, exactly, to um, talk about your work, um, which is very exciting for us, especially for Swiss architects. And maybe I just read in your biography that you don't believe in architecture anymore. <laughs> and of course, we are very curious <laughs> about your alternatives then. Um, you are involved in different collaborations. One is called um, Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. You are a filmmaker, an architect, who um, investigates in um, fiction and also the future itself, I can say that, and design, storytelling. And uh, this Tomorrow's Thoughts Today is a think tank but you're also involved in another collaboration which is called Unknown Fields Division, where you go to remote places, to strange places, alien places, to discover the place in itself. You're also teaching at different places around the world. Um, one currently is, is at the Zayark in LA, um, a studio called Fiction and Entertainment. <laughs> and we are very excited to uh, hear about you now. Thanks, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I did come from LA. The, the irony of talking about natures after stepping off a, a long-haul flight for a night isn't lost on me. Um, I, do, I do carbon offset all my flights. There's probably some forest somewhere in the world that uh, I somehow own or have paid for. Um, uh, but it's important to keep that in mind because uh, I'm, I'm not a hypocritical bastard um, much. Um, okay, uh, so what, um, what we're going to do tonight, like I, I, I try and um, make these things uh, slightly more interesting than PowerPoint presentations. Um, uh, I'm going to try and tell a story. Uh, I'm going to illustrate that story with a whole series of film clips that we've, um, we've been making, uh, a whole, whole series of films, clips of films that we've been making um, across the last few years. Um, and I'm going to try and illustrate a story of um, the post-Anthropocene, um, a world entirely constructed of machines, a world... Uh, that we call City Everywhere. So I'm going to try, in the context of, of, of natures and, and the theme tonight, I'm going to try and um, expand on this idea of the new nature that we're currently all living in, which is a city that's um, stretched across the entirety of the Earth. But let's get started. <laughs> Shaped through the mediums of fiction and entertainment. These extraordinary 
extraordinary, shared languages, the vehicles through which we exchange ideas and engage with our environment. In many ways, it's, it's impossible to underestimate the importance of media in the production of culture. So in Los Angeles at SciArc, I run a master's program in fiction and, and entertainment where students work with professionals from the worlds of film, fiction, animation, games, and documentary to build new forms of architectural practice. Because given the important and critical role that contemporary media plays in our lives, we think it's important and urgent to widen the scope of architecture beyond just buildings alone. Why shouldn't architects design the next Hollywood blockbuster or a virtual reality environment or a video game landscape or a viral video or a political campaign? So in fiction and entertainment, we engage the techniques of popular culture in order to imagine, visualize, and speculate on alternative worlds. It's a place where we tell new kinds of stories about the emerging conditions of the 21st century. So with our students, we tell stories of the alternative futures of all of our technologies. As Elon Musk launches his mission to Mars and Trump announces the formation of the Space Force, we're seeing a condition where politics and fiction are now merging together. In this short film, To Be Great, by one of our students, we see a new propaganda film from the United Republic. The government is presenting the design and animation of a speculative nation-building mission to send astronauts to Saturn and Titan. In another short film, Earth Mother, Sky Father, is a live-action music video that takes place in the year 2030 when the Congo is no longer shipping unrefined rare earth minerals out to sea, but instead it's keeping its wealth onshore and in the ground. So here the processes and infrastructure of mining have become revalued and ritualized as an important aspect of local culture. This is Africa's future through dance. This is the ceremony to the gods of rare earth. Valentine's Day in Thing City imagines the future of post-human spaces like Google data centers and Amazon warehouses. Using the same artificial intelligence code that organizes logistics infrastructure, a fictional fulfillment center at the scale of a city has been procedurally generated. And through the eyes of the city's lost machines, we watch as a girl enters Thing City on Valentine's Day, searching for a lost package. And in a near future Los Angeles, everyone sees the city through their own set of augmented reality contact lenses. And through this digital overlay, it's possible to uh, curate everyone's own experience of the world. Here we see a young Persian refugee arriving at the border to the city. She's given a mandatory set of government-issued cultural adjustment augmented reality lenses. Shut out of other people's reality, she slowly descends into her new form of digital alienation. Last Choice is a hybrid documentary exploring hikikomori, which is a condition of social withdrawal prevalent among young men in Japan. Set during the deadly earthquake and the tsunami of 2011, the film follows a hikikomori who for three years has locked himself in his room playing video games and now faces the dilemma of whether to leave or stay, which is ultimately the choice between living or dying.
And these are just some of our recent studio stories around new technology. What I want to do with my time tonight, though, is, is tell you a series of our own stories as we travel around to the dark side of our luminous screens to see the shadows cast by our glittering cities of technology. I want to tell a story of the Anthropocene, but really I want to talk about what comes next. I want to talk through a fictional place called City Everywhere, which is a landscape, a world that's endlessly remade, reshaped, engineered by and through our machines. And this city fades in around us. And we're going to tour through a collection of sites documented moments and vignettes of this new kind of city. A city of the post-anthropocene digital world. So in the landscapes of city everywhere, there is no city and country. There is no center and periphery. But rather, there's just a continuous city of technology stretched across the planet. Here, architecture is a geologic force, and we've remade the world from the scale of the cell to the tectonic plate. So we're going to tour through an atlas of geographies and gadgets and objects that might help to form a portrait of this emerging city that we're all beginning to live with. It's kind of like a city symphony stitched together from documentary footage of real sites that we've captured with the nomadic research studio Unknown Fields and the objects we create in order to understand and disseminate these conditions. And they're going to be collaged together with short fragments of speculative film projects that I develop out of these conditions in my own urban futures practice. It's a collage of past and present and all the oscillations in between. Here for our first stop on our tour through City Everywhere, we're going to go back to the beginning, to the beginning of the beginning, where seconds from zero, 13.8 billion years ago, the creation story of lithium, a fundamental component in all our technology, begins. So from the spark of the Big Bang to the flick of an electron jumping from the battery in our phones, lithium was there from the dawn of time. And in a vast cloud of swirling cosmic matter, gravity and violent collapse, the sphere of the Earth was formed and embedded within its surface was traces of this lithium. And now on our tour, we're driving along the shores of the city's energy pools through Chile and Bolivia, through a land no longer of an indigenous population, but of evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape behind the scenes of all the batteries that power our technology. 70% of the world's lithium is buried here. And you can't see it on the desperately flat horizon. You can't access it by any public road. Its mystery is protected by its isolation. But through the eyes of our unknown fields drone, we see our technology splayed out before us. 
because lithium development is not mining through extraction but through evaporation. This tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds where each shift in hue signals a rising concentration of uh, lithium salts. And from above the earth, the ground comes alive with the colors of lithium electricity. And meanwhile, on a stage in California, Elon Musk, the tech evangelist and entrepreneur, proclaims his vision for a green energy future, a world where everything might be solar in 20 years. But like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting to us a seductive future. A hopeful future, but at the same time, it's a decidedly uncomplicated one. Because now Elon Musk must literally buy Bolivia and evolve it as a new kind of divide. Because if the future is electric, if the future is buried here, then the future lies beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. And as we keep on driving, we see from a clearing in the point cloud mist the cavernous landscapes of our ephemeral technologies. It's in these massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our city everywhere begins and ends its life. We each have a little bit of the gold or aluminium from these sites in the technologies in our pockets, charged and quietly vibrating. The Aboriginal Dreamtime narratives speak of a time when the earth was soft and creation beings shaped mountains and rivers. When a rainbow serpent slinked across the ground to create a river, when a wild dog came to rest to form a mountain. But now, as the lights of the city wash out the sky, these song lines walked by these ancestral spirits are sung anew with the tracks laid down by the beasts of the mining industry. And the dreaming landscape that embodies the creation stories of Aboriginal Australians is now overlaid with the vast infrastructure of resource speculation and financial fictions. And geological survey planes track back and forth, laser scanning the earth, searching for pockets of undiscovered minerals in the ground. And the digital models of these landscapes are now linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the spot market. So as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we see that we're scoring our economy into the archaeological record. These landscapes are a chronicle of the digital permutations that drive the modern world. In the landscape, we see vehicles that no longer have drivers, but that are just systems. And mining trucks rumble up mountains and carve soil along GPS trails generated by the city's orbiting bodies above. And now we keep on going on our tour and we head deeper into the dust and we see the rhythms of the human conveyor belts of Madagascar. So one of the most precious ecological treasures of this planet is now home to one of its poorest nations. And, and here we see difficult questions raised about the relationship between necessity and luxury. The majority of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. And hidden amidst political uncertainty, this island's fragile and unique ecology is being smuggled out illegally, boat by boat, gem by gem. And rare tortoises leave in rucksacks, and precious stones are smuggled onto planes and, and onto the stages of city everywhere in pop star bling. So in these illegal mines, it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rights than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. And a hidden black market supply chain connects two choreographies, one in these lawless mine sites, and the other in the jewelry stores, hip hop music videos, and celebrity red carpets across the ocean. So for the jewelry of city everywhere, Unknown fields have used the amount of rice that the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a precious stone that 
embodies the systems through which these two worlds are intimately and profoundly connected. The red Madagascan rice grown endemically on the island is a staple food of the miners, and it's been collected locally and shipped to gem specialists for carbon analysis. By subjecting the rice to extreme heat and pressure in the lab, we're able to form a single synthetic stone encoded with the sum of the human conveyor belt's labor. And after manufacture, the, the gemstone was set into a gold tooth, ready for that million dollar smile and the outrageous lyric. So from killer jewels to carrots to the nightclub in the glare of this cheeky gold grin, we see the cost of luxury, of beauty, we are gonna do what of a daily know. allowance of rice, and of 20 men shoveling at the bottom of a hole. And we jump back in our taxi and we keep on heading through our tour of city everywhere. And close by, we roll up now to the shores of the radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia. This lake sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. On our tour here, we see the breadcrumbs of technology scattered around a village organized around metals and hardware components. Here, these villages are buried not by soil, but by collective piles of e-waste gathered in their houses and they mine the discarded landscapes for lead, tin, nickel, neodymium, and copper. And next to the pot of noodles simmers the acid bar, separating metals, dissolving circuit wafers, and flavoring their soup. And this lake nearby sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery and the material to polish the screens of our phones and run our software produces this very lake. And from this black sludge, unknown fields have made a vase for City Everywhere. It's a set of vases made from the amount of waste created in the production of three objects of technology, an iPhone, a MacBook, and a Tesla electric car battery. It's a new material aesthetic for the technology born of the earth. It's a Ming vase for the city everywhere generation. And from all these landscapes on the edge of the world, the city everywhere starts to grow and beat and buzz. And now the city takes us to see where all this raw material is refined and shaped into the familiar objects that fill our lives. Almost all the world's Christmas decorations produced here. That tree lighting up your lounge, the novelty stocking filler is all made in landscapes like this one and made by the human machines of city everywhere that are orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. These are the real robots of our new landscapes of technology where our bodies are matched in speed to the conveyor belts that turn in front of it. Here in Shenzhen, we find 90% of the world's electronics. And we brand our technologies with terms like cloud or air or featherweight, but in reality, they're, they're violently wrenched from the earth. And as our personal electronics tend towards the invisible, they conjure in their shadows an undeniably visible gray mountain, a one kilometer deep pit, 10 square kilometer radioactive tailings lake, all a counterweight to the apparent immateriality of computing, communications, and electric energy. The digital infrastructure of our world has extraordinary implications on material experience. These are the architectures behind the screen and beyond the fog of the smart city cloud. These are the physical outputs of our digital engagement with the world. But maybe we can start to imagine on our tour what would happen if we started to design our gadgets not based on how they slid into our pockets or how they felt in our hand, but on the networks they might set in motion or the economic resources they might distribute. What could the alternative design criteria be for our technology if it wasn't engineered around supply chain efficiencies 
cheap labor costs and material availability. So in the same area of city everywhere, a camera flashes, a model pounces, and we see fast fashion's rolling tide dump mountains of cheap clothing onto the high street's shores. Objects of desire worn for one wild night and then destined to be discarded. Now on our tour, we pick at a loose thread on the garment we're all wearing and we unravel it across continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field in search of our runway dreams and our street blue jeans. So before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of tens of thousands of miles in their process of production, making textiles the most globalized industry on the planet. And the byproduct of this pace and scale of production is the destruction of the very thing that brought the industry to Southeast Asia originally. Here in our tour, we now meet the last generation of master weavers, a group whose skills will now die with them. The apprentices they would once train now man the rumbling mechanized looms of global fashion, raw cotton plugging their ears deaf to the din of the world around them. And now we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist who lovingly tweaks the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic cheap and fake yarns used by all the other companies around him. So as we span from fashion victim to victims of fashion for the cloth of city everywhere, unknown fields have woven a collaborative textile with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in Varanasi. An audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftspeople and the sounds of their looms has been translated into a black and white binary pattern. And then this pattern has been woven into the cloth. And in this way, the textile becomes an archive encoded with the skills and stories of a dying craft and woven from the same hands that it's trying to remember. And to make the thread for this textile, we follow the container ships that bring fast fashion to our shores all the way to their death, where after their short 25 year lifespan, they return to the shores of India and Bangladesh to be broken up and salvaged in the shipbreaking yard. And we collected fragments of this raw steel cut from the rusting carcasses of dead ships. We melted it down to form the core of the gold thread. It's a textile archive that's born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being. And now the cloth covers a young Indian textile worker who walks slowly on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry with supply chain where she works. And as she walks across city everywhere, she's gradually wrapped in the glistening gold textile as she bears witness to a series of transformations like weaving, dyeing, sewing, and pressing. And her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk and the path our disposable fashion takes in global production. And the path so many women like her have taken in moving from village to factory to city. And her journey ends as she's completely cocooned, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships that will soon export her and everything that we wear all the way to the shores of the West. Hopefully what we can start to get a sense of on our tour is that city everywhere cannot be described as a single point on a map. Our technologies cast shadows that stretch across the earth. And now on our tour we pack up all the objects and materials produced in these sites we visited and we send them off in ships around the world. 
this is the computer-controlled container fleet of the mega shipping industry that now navigates autonomously based on GPS satellites. And the ship captain and the port side crane operators have also been made obsolete. And in the north, as the ice melts, the busiest shipping lane in human history is beginning to open up. It's the mythical Northwest Passage, a true incentive for climate deniers, a route that will cut global shipping times in half. But here, the cities of the Arctic coast would still stand empty, filled with the unmanned beasts of global trade. Autonomous machine cities, just like the rest of our ports, scattered along this magical new coastline. And here on our tour, we see a lone engineer and her dog heading back from a maintenance run. Like a lighthouse keeper, just her, the horizon, and the creaking cranes. Her body has been repurposed as a component in the landscape-scaled robot that stacks the containers ready for transport. And now we listen and hear another tale of a strange floating artifact. This is about the Sandy Island mystery everywhere. that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. Sandy Island was actually um, found on the Google Earth. So as we travel across this pixel sea of city everywhere, we hear of a strange new land. Just off the coast of the city is Sandy Island, a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks, and stories. It was originally charted by the whaling ship Velocity back in 1876, and since then the island has long been what's called an evidence doubtful landmass. Perhaps it was a mistaken label, a mistaken pile of volcanically ejected pumice that was seen drifting on the horizon or, a, or a, something to support a map's copyright. But whatever it was, this cartographic apparition remained visible in the Google Earth models of city everywhere until an Australian research vessel confirmed its non-existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. So up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, Sandy Island was just as real as any other place they might visit online. So in City Everywhere, as well as these physical geographies, we start to see strange new digital entities. Because when it's machines that do the looking, these digital geographies become new and occupiable sites. Landscapes with a hashtag, buildings of coordinates that fade in and out. Buildings like this one, where the ship that we're traveling through pulls up to the shores of the Amazon Fulfillment Center. This is where we keep everything in city everywhere. And the Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on a complex sorting algorithm that's engineered around sales frequencies and buying patterns. And here we watch as the Amazon robots rush through the stacks navigating from book to book, filling orders by following the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational programming. This is the library of City Everywhere that's not organized around the Dewey Decimal System, but around aggregated data sets and buying habits. It's a library that isn't organized for us, but instead it's a space organized by algorithms and inhabited by bodies, repurposed and machines. Follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping about above our heads and drifting above this sea of neon haze. The drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons. And we customize our drones like we once did our phones. And the skin of the city is warm, freckled with a thousand lights winking just for us. And the traffic lights flock at rush hour. And our delivery packages rain down in an Amazon hailstorm. And the rumble of drone propellers has become a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation. And all the dogs in city everywhere are walked by drones now. And they deliver our pizzas, hot dog stuffed crusts, as how we like them in city everywhere. And now we see a network of drones that monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. 
and we watch as a young girl has hacked and decorated her own drone. And she uses it to pass notes to her boyfriend who's trapped under surveillance by the drones in the tower and opposite. And they're like kids in an old fashioned classroom. They scroll messages on the drone and they send it back and forth between the towers. So in this near future city, drones form both agents of state surveillance, but they also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teenagers might fall in love. And another drone, armed just with a dildo, disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. Another drone, armed with a different kind of cylindrical device, flies overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. And here we are now getting closer to the sites of the city where we find ourselves. We head to the residential districts, we head to the Samsung Towers of City Everywhere and we put our ears to the cool beveled aluminium door of one of the apartments and we listen to an argument that's going on inside on the other side of the door. Inside we hear Jury drop her Samsung Galaxy SX phone onto the kitchen table. We hear it chime softly with the Samsung Kui Smart Power charging mat. We hear her scream down the hallway at her husband, raising her voice over the Samsung air conditioner. Why does the new TV say LG on it? She screams at him. What do you mean, he says. Because it's made by LG, he replies. She screams back, are you trying to get us thrown out? Our, our lease is up for review in three months and you brought an LG TV into a Samsung housing block. What the hell will the neighbors say, she says. And the city just shrugs and glares at us with a million sensor eyes. And we head to another apartment. And the fire department rushes past us as we hear a scream from inside South Korean inside woman got a rude door. awakening when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, locked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. The vacuum suction was far from gentle, and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, who has not been named, was unable to free herself and called the fire department with a desperate rescue plea. And we head to another apartment, and again we hear a scream through the door. Hines was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. The guy on the other side of the door scanned the label to read about the latest recipe promotion but instead was directed to German porn site Funderado. So in City Everywhere, we share our lives with these strange, weird, beating, purring objects. And now on our tour, we head to where they all live. We head to the heart of the city and we drive along the aisles of Facebook machines. We head past all of our messages, photos, inane chatter, hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears. And the electric car motors have given way to the whir of cooling fans. And these aren't grand cathedrals. This isn't a great library, but at a time when our collective history is digital, this is City Everywhere's cultural legacy. And perhaps we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles like we once did for rolling hills. And power plant fog hangs heavy in the air. And we picnic under the sodium glow of a row of artificial suns. And hidden within the server sacks, the city takes us to visit the renderlands and the data farms. And we head through the Indian quarter of the city. So in the design studios of the West, um, architects and directors sketch out their dreams for imaginary cities. While in India, across the other side of the planet, a massive anonymous workforce turned these wireframe worlds into the high fidelity digital architectures of developer renderings, video games, and Hollywood blockbusters. 
And this is the city that's left behind when everything disappears into the thickness of the screen or the lens of Google Glass, Oculus, or HTC Vive. Perhaps modern film studios are an analogy for the urban spaces that are emerging in city everywhere, where we see a new kind of architecture covered in a new type of ornament that's based on calibration crosshairs and targets. We see a city stripped back to become the scaffolds and infrastructure for a digitally constructed world. We see an architecture that's lying in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. And the city is filled with the digital confetti of our desired worlds projected just for us. And this is the future that all our technologies is promising us. We're told we're going to live out our lives in the world of Minority Report. Sparkle. You can move the old-fashioned way. Century 21. John Anderton! You can use right about now. Escape from it all, Linda Lewis. What? John Anderton? Forget your troubles. Put slow. John Anderton. But when we turn off this augmented world, when we turn off the bespoke billboards of Minority Report's urban spaces, when we turn off the tailored ads, the navigational prompts, the Tinder profiles, the track status updates of our sci-fi cityscapes, we will see a green studio world where everything is becoming screen. And now on our tour, we visit another apartment an augmented apartment in an up-and-coming area of the city where the renderings on developer billboards have become the inhabitable utopias of augmented reality fueled gentrification. And again, we eavesdrop in to another conversation. We hear a real estate agent showing a client around a digital construction site. Here, the physical shell of the building becomes a kind of fixer upper canvas and building debris and unsightly neighbors are hidden behind the rendered glow of our digital imaginaries. And the occupation of space can now be reimagined on individual scales where each of us can tune in to our own architectural channel. Okay, so uh, what were you thinking? The real estate agent asks as a Google image search box appears beside the door. We have some lovely 21st century textures, she says. Early Floyd, classic Tilgo offer something really special I can offer you one of our IKEA packs. Very eclectic, very tasteful, 100% uncustomized, she smiles. And she clicks a few buttons. A daybed winks out of existence to be replaced by a set of side tables in primary colors and a rectangular bookcase. Ooh, a lax, he says, and a billy, he smiles. And they tap some more buttons and a series of blonde and laminate objects start to appear around the space. A low Japanese style bed overlays the couch and he sinks down into it. His eyes gleamed over in a pixel glaze. And we keep on rolling. As we keep on driving through our tour of city everywhere, we hear a dull roar fill the cabin of the car as we drive. We wind down a window and in the distance we can hear an audience starting to scream and go crazy. Have you ever been to a Hatsune Miku concert? She's the pop star of City Everywhere. She's a pop star for the City Everywhere generation. She's a 3D projection with a larger fan base than most living musicians. And the crowd waves their glow sticks as the digital ghost of the city. Because Hatsune is the first animated pop star. 
just like the Kardashians or the bloggers and Instagram stars. She has no physical presence, she's just a media construction, an agglomeration of pixels. And to the beat of Hatsune's hologram, the young ravers of City Everywhere dance with explosive contortions as they invent a new choreography that distorts the silhouette and disguises the proportions of their body so as to evade body detection algorithms that's now used by city surveillance cameras. And they reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate of Moore's law, or the latest phone model updates or software change, rather than an evolution of natural seasons. And they adorn themselves in anti-facial recognition makeup. And they develop new camouflage textiles and a new hoodie that's designed to be invisible to the scanning technologies of the smart city. And their iridescent textiles reflect the light of CCTV scanners to create exuberant glitches and distortions in the City Everywhere dataset. And we jump back in our taxi. And the words, hello world, are blinking on the dashboard display. Our journey is now at an end and the system is rebooting. So a Hello World program is a super simple computer software system that um, outputs Hello World onto a display. It's used to verify that a language or system is operating correctly at the very beginning of its life. It's the first word spoken to us by a new system. And a Hello World burdens onto the screen announcing itself, telling us that everything is going to be just fine. But in many ways, City Everywhere never gave us this warning. We aren't sure how it got here, but we're certainly not going to let it leave. It's just too seductive and too shiny and too easy. So hopefully from our tour, we can see that our technologies, our buildings, our spaces are formed from a planetary scaled machine. An infrastructure so large that it has become invisible, a machine so often disguised, ignored, or forgotten behind the gloss of the screen, the seamless aluminium edge, or the glare of the pixel. But in City Everywhere, ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as our technology. But perhaps here, if we can understand and map the systems of this city, then we can begin to reimagine them to start to conjure new kinds of stories or new mythologies and new technologies for a new kind of city. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met and the city wraps us in a in warm future, embrace. In the future, everything will be smart, connected and make it all better. And the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin and the streets are lined with sensors. In the future, everything will be smart connected and make it all better and our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen in the future everything will be smart connected and make it all better in the future everything will be smart smart, connected connected, and make make it it all better better. in the the future future, everything will be smart smart, connected and and make make it all better better. in the future everything will be smart connected and and make make it it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better. In the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all Do you guys do questions? Do you want do you want to do questions? Do you have questions? I have a question to your last sentence that in the future everything will be smart, connected and all better. Yeah. That was slightly ironic. I don't know if you ah, got okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's already the answer. <laughs> yeah. No, because um also like 
what is for you the, the boundary between fiction and reality? Do you think it's already completely connected or do you think there is still um, distance to it? Yeah, no, we, we, I mean, we're, we're firmly in the post-truth world, as they say. Like, I, I think, um, uh, I mean, all fiction uh, constructs its own kind of truth. Uh, I mean, Foucault talks about it as kind of truth effects, right? Like, um, uh, it's important. Did that die? Yeah. It's impossible to distinguish between, um, uh, you know, the, the construct of a fiction and um, uh, some kind of notion of uh, authentic um, reality and truth that, that, that these fictions kind of produce our world. And that's why I kind of, we became more interested in telling stories and, and working with mediums like film. Um, Is a, I think there is a, um, uh, a really interesting way that you can actually start to shape and make space through the production of fictions. You know, like if we acknowledge that um, uh, fiction is this extraordinary shared medium through which our culture shares and disseminates ideas, fictions produce a kind of truth, then um, we need to be seeing fiction and storytelling as a critical act of design. Um, that we can design, design fictions to design the world. Um, uh, and I, that's what I think um, architects need to be much better at in many ways. Um, I mean, there's been a history of really seismic, um, uh, extraordinary projects from the, from the canons of unbuilt architecture um, that in many ways have just as much consequence, and I would argue even more consequence, than the physical act of making some buildings. Um, and that's the kind of architecture that we're interested in, where we, where we co-opt the mediums of fiction to tell um, important urban and architectural stories and to disseminate them to, to broader audiences. So, um, yeah, if, if fictions produce our world, then we better get good at telling the right kinds of stories. Yeah. Um, uh, but to, to, to answer in more fully your, your, what was going to be your first question, um, the, the purpose of that last statement is to talk about um, the ways that, and, and to hint at the ways that we, we normally describe and talk through our technology. We're presenting technologies through a very solutionist lens. Um, we're told that these things are going to save, save our lives, they're going to save the climate, they're going to better connect us to our mother, um, they're going to give us better orgasms. Um, uh, entertain us, free us from work, um, uh, but in reality, it's obviously much more complex than that. So we're, we're, we're told very particular narratives of technology, and, and what I was trying to do, even though it may seem quite dystopian, is, is just we, we start to try and talk about and tell counter-narratives around these technologies, that it's not that simple, it's much more complex. Um, no technology is a singular solution, um, to a problem of the world, but really they, they, they just exaggerate the problems that already exist. What we need to be talking about are cultural shifts, not um, band-aid, sticky tape solutions by any particular um, piece of tech. Um, uh, so obviously the, the last statement is ironic. Um, uh, um, technology isn't going to make our lives better. Technology is, is um, full fraught with the same frailties and contradictions as we are. Um, technology is equal parts fear and wonder because um, so are we. Uh, and we need to get better at telling those more complicated, nuanced narratives around technology rather than just standing in line waiting for the next iPhone to be released. Yeah. Does anyone have another question? How do you find your material? I mean, where, what is your, um, when does your story start or where do you find your stories? Yeah, I mean, with uh, like even the s the science fiction narratives, the future narratives, all begin with a deep engagement in the present. Um, so, unknown fields that, um, uh, which is essentially it's a documentary studio that we run out of London um, with another architect, Kate Davies. Um, unknown fields starts um, by just trying to take the temperature of the room. Really, like um, uh, we 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 look at. Um, what's a contemporary discussion that we think we can um, participate in or offer something unique on. Um, uh, and then we travel to the site um, uh, of that issue. Um, uh, and we begin with boots on the ground, ex exploring um, 
uh, kind of what we could describe as the weak signals of possible futures as they occur in the present tense. Um, uh, so there's this quote from um, uh, William Gibson, the famous science fiction author, who says that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, Unknown Fields takes that rather literally um, and gets on a plane and flies to these pockets of the future and documents them in some form, makes objects, makes films that kind of look at that emerging condition. Um, and then from there, um, in my LA practice, we kind of take those observations and we start to exaggerate them or project them into possible futures. So, so it's not about trying to predict what might come, but it's trying to extrapolate from um, uh, emergent conditions today um, and, just, and just see what, what futures they might generate. Um, and that's really the, the practice and, and process of the work. So you might take, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the Lithium Project, um, uh, that's a much longer film that Unknown Fields did called um, The Breast Milk of the Volcano, which is um, uh, just premiered in, in London um, in November, uh, which is this month, last week premiered, um, uh, which is talking about um, where our lithium comes from, um, this amazing indigenous landscape um, that uh, the rest of the world is trying to buy. You just saw what's happening um, with uh, Morales, the Bolivian president, um, uh, who was ousted and forced to leave, um, who was trying to instigate a nationalized um, uh, lithium mining economy. Um, you know, now, the, now that he's gone, I'm sure the multinationals are, uh, are waiting at the door, um, trying to get enough lithium to fill all the orders for, for Elon Musk's new uh, Tesla truck. Um, uh, but we went there um, just after Elon Musk um, did this famous tech keynote where he launched the Tesla Powerwall battery. Um, and it's talked about as being the, the most kind of disruptive um, or seismic tech keynote since Steve Jobs launched the iPod. Um, in that keynote, he, very, he, he just gives kind of tertiary mention to where all the lithium for this new battery-powered future is going to come from. It's going to be some mysterious source in, in Nevada somewhere, which is total bullshit. He's going to buy Bolivia. Um, uh, and um, uh, we wanted to explore you know, the other side of this seductive future that he was presenting. So we got on a plane and we, we went to, to see where 70% of the world's lithium lives. Um, and then we made that film. Um, or the fashion film that Unknown Fields did um, uh, very briefly uh, a year ago or so, um, uh, the head of Inditex um, uh, became the richest man in the world, um, uh, like ousting Bill Gates for about a month. Um, uh, and then Bill Gates launched some new app or Surface tablet or something and beat him again. But um, a lot of people might not have heard of Inditex before. Um, uh, Inditex is the umbrella company that, that owns Zara and all these fashion labels um, that we see on our kind of main streets. Um, and we're like, what the fuck is Inditex? Who, who is this guy? And how is the hell is he the richest person on the planet? Um, and why haven't we heard about him? Um, uh, so we got on a plane and went to India and, and kind of walked through the Zara supply chain to just to see how um, this, 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 all this money is being produced. Um, so we always kind of find those little kind of tweaks and the, the, those little kind of disruptions to the norm and say, wow, what's going on there? And then we go and figure it out and then we start to imagine future scenarios that, um, that might be generated from those contexts. Yeah, it's a really long answer to a simple question. I guess you're not welcome in every place you go. Um, how do you finance your work? You know, I mean, you yeah, not very well. Um, uh, um, it's it's I don't think it's not uh, it's not necessary that to say that we're we're not welcome. Like it, we we f obviously I wouldn't frame the work that we do in the way that I'm doing tonight um, in every other context that I operate in. So um, with unknown fields, Kate and I um, are very careful to not position the companies or the or the factories that we might visit as being the the bad guys, um, it's, it, it's just too simple. It's not interesting, um, it's just too easy. Um, and, it, and it denies the real complexity of what's going on. Uh, so we try and engage them and say, look, um, we want to tell the story of where all our shit comes from. You're part of that story, and most people don't know it. Um, uh, we want to kind of scratch the surface or, or look under the hood 
and peel back the curtain, um, let us in. Um, uh, and it, it generally, if we frame it like that, then um, the doors tend to open. Um, you know, if we say uh, we're doing this expose on rare earth mineral mining um, and uh, toxic pollution, um, uh, do you mind if we take some photographs? We're not going to get very far. Um, but it, that's not the story we want to tell either. You know, like really, we're not trying to like expose the sweatshops of India. Um, we're trying to talk about our own complicity and relationship to those landscapes. That that where the where the active agents that produce them, not some kind of um, uh, Indian factory boss who's who's evil and drives around in a Porsche. Um, that's not the reality of things. So, um, uh, you know, in, in, in India. You know, we're, we're we're presenting ourselves as, as as people that wanted to celebrate the the people and the places where so much of our stuff is made, um, because there's an active and massive media machine which is trying to deny um, the existence of these territories. So um, we hope that the the that the, the, these places we go to, we 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 engage them as collaborators in the project, not as um, victims. Uh, um, or unwilling participants in some kind of, um, uh, you know, colonialist um, savior project. Um, yeah, so that's you know, it, it, we're trying to be uh, in intelligent about and, and respectful about how we um, uh, do the work. Uh, I mean, that said, you know, there's plenty of stuff where we have to carry in hidden cameras, and um, we've done stuff like that. We've hidden like. We've swapped out SD cards in order to get footage, certain footage out of places and things like that. Um, uh, so we can talk about those kind of fun stories, but um, they're few and far between. It, it, it's, it's more about, um, yeah, really trying to work with people to tell their that, to tell that story. Your movies are quite quickly cut. I mean, I mean, this one is because I'm trying to squeeze like 20 films into 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, most of them are really dull, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they're really long, and they sit in galleries, and you just like sit and uh, yeah, you get it. Uh, there's only so many drone shots of lithium fields you can get before you you kind of understand what's going on. Um, uh, yeah, I mean another part of your question: How do we fund stuff? Like, um, you know, we we to a certain extent, unknown fields operates as a kind of an art practice um, where we get commissions from galleries. We we apply for grants um, to do documentary work. Most documentaries are shaped and, and made that way. Um, documentaries aren't a commercial enterprise. Um, only like you know two or three in the last few years have actually made any money. Um, uh, so Unknown Fields operates in those terms. That's why it's still based in London, um, uh, because we can squeeze out the last vestiges of EU funding before UK makes its Brexit. Um, uh, but then, you know, my, my main practice is is, is in LA. Um, so my fiction work is produced out of LA, um, and that's funded through um, kind of the film industry channels. Um, uh, and we do world building for Hollywood and and TV shows. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, fiction is is easier to fund through through private private networks because there's an existing market for that and a context for how that stuff gets screened. So. You know that drone, the drone film about these two teenagers was broadcast on um, and funded by Channel Four in the UK, um, uh, and then um, uh, we'll go, go and go through each of them. But but yeah, it's it's coming from from um, private private funding in America. Yeah. Can you also say something about the role of the aesthetics in your in your work? I mean, just yeah. looking at what the content. Of role you pick just seems to be very important. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we think that um, there's some value in an aesthetic practice that can um, help to connect audiences to, um, uh, to complex issues. Like, it can cut through and um, some of that complexity, um, but it can also do so in a way that, that, that still leaves some sort of nuance. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, I mean, there is an, a kind of an aestheticization of some of these conditions, um, but we think there's value in that. Um, uh, it, it, it 
opens up the work and, and, and allows us to operate in, in contexts that it wouldn't otherwise do so. Um, uh, you know, really what we're trying to do, um, I talk about it as a form of, um, uh, like, you know, a lot of these issues like supply chains and, and technologies are, and, and even things like climate change are described through processes of data visualization. Um, I talk about the work that we do as a form of data dramatization. Um, and I think an aesthetic practice is, is akin to that, where you start to imbue a lot of these conditions with um, uh, emotion, um, uh, where you force um, the audience into particular um, relationships with the material that they wouldn't otherwise exist within if, if they were just presented through a kind of a, a very cold and detached documentary frame. Um, uh, so I'm interested in, you know, a lot of the, the precedence for the work that, that we do, I think, is, is in the movements like new journalism, um, uh, Gonzo, or, you know, the use of literary forms to talk about real-world scenarios um, uh, where um, uh, fiction is sometimes um, uh, um, the best form of fact. Um, uh, so... Um, we also fictionalize these conditions as a process of um, trying to get into um, uh, you know another uh, more uh, closer to a truth I suppose um, Hunter s Thompson says that um, it 's impossible to be objective uh, uh, about Nixon you know um, and I think it 's probably true um, again today that it 's impossible to be objective um, detached when talking about a trumpified world. Um, uh, so yeah, so we use the, the tools of an aesthetic practice, the tools of film, the tools of the entertainment industry to start to um, engage people in these fictions um, in a way that hopefully is productive. As you said, obviously the, um, what you call the extrapolation of the borders of the um, everywhere city is very dystopian, yet you say that as architects or designers or planners or, or visionaries or whatever we should, or there is a way to shape the future through a narrative or a narrative, a design narrative, I suppose, which implies a potential positive um, a, a turn to the matter, right? So is there space for, or let's say, interest in utopia in your work, in your practice as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, not really, um, but it, there's an interest in ambiguity um, and nuance, I think. Um, I mean, w w I, I would describe a lot of the stuff we do as, as, as kind of forms of productive dystopia, um, that, uh, as I said, what we're really trying to do is put into the world counter-narratives, um, and at the moment, the, the, the dominant discourse around technology is, is a utopian one, um, a solutionist one, so a lot of the unknown fields work, the more documentary-based work is trying to kind of travel around to the, the other side of technology to see um, the things we don't normally talk about in kind of tech keynotes and Apple ads. Um, but the sci-fi, like the, the dominant language of sci-fi is dystopia. Um, so works like um, In the Robot Skies, which is the drone film, works like Renderlands, which is the film about Prakash, the render farm worker falling in love. Um, they're kind of, uh, no, no, they're not utopias, they're, they're more complex stories um, where there is some magic and charm and wonder um, within them, um, whilst at the same time, yes, that we're in an outsourced render farm um, in India um, or in a surveillance state, in a council estate in London, but there's opportunities and new forms of agency that start to emerge in those contexts. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think that's what we try and do is, again, it's just about counter-narratives and, and as, as the dominant media narrative shifts, so will our narratives in response. Um, Hollywood's really great at telling dystopian tales um, because it's easier. Um, like it's easier for a screenwriter to come up with conflict in a world that's really shitty than it is in a world that's really amazing. Um, uh, and that's really hard, so um, we try and do that. I guess, so our sci-fi is kind of optimistic and utopian. The, some of the clips um, of this giant kind of chinese -y looking city um, at the start of the presentation is from a, our new, a new film called Planet City, 
which is a city for the entire population of the Earth, um, a city for seven billion people um, that we're designing, and it um, it's a you know it's utopian and optimistic where we where we um, uh, kind of totally deconstruct the entire planet of city everywhere and we rebuild a single city um, allowing the rest of the earth to return to a kind of rewilding state, um, a natural state. Um, that's supposed to be optimistic and utopian. Um, or at least it's, 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 it's about prototyping um, within that city new forms of um, uh, uh, living um, with density. Um, uh, and about prototyping um, new, a new value system that we might um, start to engender or develop um, in a, in a, in a post-climate world. So, um, yeah, we're trying to be hopeful in the sci-fi stuff. Ish, yeah. When you talk about we, who is we, how many we there are, and uh, how do you organize such a group of people? Uh, uh, the internet. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a royal we. The we changes and shifts. Um, the we of unknown fields is, is me and Kate, um, uh, and then a whole group of collaborators in the various locations that we go to. The we of um, the sci-fi work and the fiction work in, in LA um, is uh, you know b me and whoever it is that, that particular projects need. Like, hope you get a sense of the work, that it's, it's not like just rerunning the same kind of story over and over again. So, um, you know, I, I don't have, like for the, I don't, I don't have a studio where there's like a whole bunch of drone engineers sitting around waiting for me to do another drone film. Um, you know, you just put out little feelers on the network and say, hey, we're doing a drone film, we need drone people. Um, and then you get a bunch of drone people, you work on the film and then it dissolves again. Um, and then the Where the City Can't See, which is the LiDAR scanning film with the dancers and at the end of the presentation, um, uh, that, would, that, that needed kind of animators and coders and, and, and people that could write software to help us use the LiDAR scanner and start to animate with it. That's another group of people that, again, I can't afford to like, keep these people on staff constantly, otherwise I'd just be the LiDAR scanning guy, I'd be the drone guy. Um, uh, but it's really the same kind of business model as um, as Hollywood, right? The, f the film industry works on like project-based models of practice, where um, you make a film, you build the team for that film, and then when that film is done, it disbands, and that team is like thousands and thousands of people, and they just build it for one off, um, and then every film they remake, um, and that's kind of the model. So uh, I just have a, a big network um, of people that I can email. Um, uh, so most of my time is spent emailing. Um, uh, I'm an I'm a email artist, really. Um, at the core of it, email is my medium. Uh, and I'm probably pretty good at emails. Um, <laughs> it's probably my strength. Just these love letters that you send out into the world saying, hey, I like your stuff. Let's do stuff together. Yeah. So f first of all, uh, I'd like to say, Thank you to you, Liam. Um, because I, I think in, in our context, in the Swiss context, it is so important to have people like you are, architects, who show us what architecture also can you know, influence. That we as architects are more than, or can be more than builders that we can tell stories, that we can shape the world, and that we have an enormous influence on, you know, on the future. So thank you very much for coming all the way.